Good afternoon and welcome. This is the webinar for the Masters of Science in Patent Law titled Patent Careers. And my name is Professor Chris Tarosky, and with me is... I'm Keaton. I'm a current student in the Master of Science Patent Law program. And also manning the questions is program assistant Jason Stebner. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, mute your lines and type in any questions, and we will reserve time at the end for questions. Next slide. So... So a little bit about myself. I am a patent lawyer. Uh, I practiced patent law for 20 years, and now I'm uh, full-time on the faculty here at the University of Minnesota Law School. And I direct the patent programs for both our JD Law degree-seeking students and our Masters of Science of Patent Law degree-seeking students. Yeah, um, so I am, um, like I said, I'm a current student in the program right now. Uh, I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I went to Loyola, Loyola University, Chicago. I graduated with, with a degree in biochemistry. Um, and yeah, now I'm a student now. So what we'll talk to about today is we'll talk generally about patents. We'll talk about some careers where you could use patent in, in your career, whether you're in R&D, uh, whether you're in industry, or whether you stay in academia. And then uh, we'll speak briefly about our specific program here at the law school, the Master of Patent Law degree program. And again, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. So let's talk about patents generally. What a patent is, is it's a monopoly. It's an exclusive right granted to you by the government. And if uh, you receive a patent, you've got the right to stop others from making or using or selling your patented invention or innovation for a period of time, for about 20 years. In return for getting this government monopoly, you must disclose in your patent to the public how to enable someone of skill in the art to use your invention. So it's a really good thing. I think patents uh, help disseminate technology to the world. Patents are fun and interesting to me. I'm a, a BS in chemistry. What's your background? Biochemistry. Biochemistry. So, so I think all, I, we love technology. I think all business is based on technology. Even Supercut's business is based on technology. You need an app to get in there, uh, to get your appointment, to schedule an appointment, to know how you like your hair cut and how to bring you back. And to, uh, It's all technology-based, and all businesses are based on technology. So I think no matter what you do, uh, if you have a STEM career, you're, you're well positioned to be a researcher um, or to be a technical support person in business or QA or QC or even working in marketing business. Your STEM background is going to serve you well. I'm particularly interested in law, how law intersects with technology and business and how patents can help enable people and businesses to accomplish their business objectives. So we'll go through a few examples of that. We're going to go through a, a short survey uh, through time, we're going to travel back to 1915 and look at a few patents, and then we're going to fast forward and, and see how those patents have helped businesses. So take yourself back to 1915. This is a patent for a... Looks like a wrench. <laughs> a wrench. Uh, so back in 1915, a wrench was innovative. What was probably innovative about this was the spanning mechanism and the clasping mechanism. Uh, after 20 years, this patent would have expired, but back then, it probably was a groundbreaking invention. Think about being the only one to be able to sell a crescent wrench for, for 20 years. I think this design was so good uh, that people uh, may not have improved on it much past then. Fast forward 10 years, about 10 years later, to 1931. This company was able to achieve uh, obtaining a patent for a hair driver in, in the electrical field. So they, you can see the heating up of a coil in a handle and blowing air to dry a person's hair. Uh, how this, biz, this patent may have had value to the business is, right, I'm sell, making and selling hair dryers and someone can't copy me. Fast forward about another uh, five years, and here is a, a innovative patent for the iconic design for a Zippo uh, pocket lighter. Now, what's really how this patent, I think, gave the business value is there was a, a period of 20 years or a lead time where Zippo was the only one that could sell this type of lighter, and they established their market so well that they, even after the patent expired, 
they still were able to use the same design and keep other people's out because no one really could compete with the, uh, the brand and reputation and the quality of the Zippo lighter. Fast forward, uh, you can get a patent for a, uh, a design. I know we have some students from Wisconsin on the line. So uh, I think Fender Guitar was, was Waukesha, Wisconsin. So you, there's a patent for the iconic design for a guitar. Uh, fast forward, 1972. Uh, although this is a simple mechanical invention and the shape of the grill probably isn't innovative, what was innovative here is applying to a charcoal, an old, old charcoal grill, they uh, learned how to fire it with gas or propane. Patent expired about 20 years later. Now, we all played with these when we were younger, and this was breakthrough technology back then. Why was this a good, why was this a good toy, Keaton? It's fun. You can, you can shoot other people with water. Well, it's not to like about it. With more water than your enemy. Uh, but you can see why the patent would give protection to the designer of the super soaker. It might be able to keep copyists out. Uh, Amazon Kindle, 2009. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to 1915, and Keaton, I'll ask you a question. We said in 1915, uh, Kay Peterson of the Crescent Company was able to obtain a patent for this innovative design for a wrench. The patent duration lasted 20 years. Here's a patent issued in 2001 for a wrench to, uh, apologize for the name, but cha-ching she. How in the heck can you get a patent on a wrench that was already old in 1915? How could cha-ching get a patent in 2001? Putting me on the spot. I think it's because it is, it's a new invention or an improvement on a pre-existing one. So the improvement is? Whatever the, thing is, you know, the, the locking the mechanism, okay, it's right? A locking mechanism. <laughs> right. There's a problem with the old wrench that no one was able to solve. The, the spanner, when you when you tried to wrench on something, the wrench might be loose, mm -hmm. so you can lock the tightness of the wrench. So then, in 2001, Cha-Ching didn't get a patent for all wrenches or all crescent wrenches. They got a patent for the improvement of the locking mechanism. It would be able to stop others from making and using and selling a locking mechanism on a crescent wrench, which might have given them value. So that's why I talk about patents uh, generally and how they're intersection of law, business, and technology. So that's kind of a survey going backwards. Keaton, anything to add? No, I, I think that one thing is a lot of people, before I knew a little bit more about patents. A lot of people thought that a patent gives you the right to use to use or make something. It not as, It's not necessarily that it's the right to restrict others from making, using, or selling that product. And that's, I think, a common, a common confusion between the two. So just one thing to highlight, I suppose, going forward is a lot of people think, uh, make that simple confusion. Yeah, pat I mean, and it's a common mistake, and patents are a different world, right? We know how to do distillations in the lab. We know how to uh, prepare drawings for mechanical invention and, and use a process, but uh, right? There's a special world when it comes to law and patents. Right. It's just a specialized area. And that's something we're going to talk about next with this, with this love of technology and this interest in patents, what you can do uh, with some patent knowledge. What I like to say about uh, a career in patents, although I have a, a chemistry background, uh, patents are able to take you beyond the lab. You're able to get out of the lab, you're able to interact with people, or you're able to work at your computer, but uh, not everyone wants to be in the environment that they ended up in school for, for whatever reason. So patents can help you uh, get out of the lab. Uh, and my story on that is um, my, I, my lab book would get eaten away by acid, my pants would be dirty, I wanted to wear cute, cute shoes in the lab, uh, but I just didn't want to work in the lab like my dad did, so I decided to um, go to law school. How about you, Keaton? Uh, yeah, so it's a similar story. I, um, most of my work was with microscopy, so I was always in a dark room looking through a microscope all the time. Um, and it got depressing after a while, and you know, I, I appreciated the science, but I didn't, R&D wasn't for me. Um, I more appreciated the application end of it. And I think that's where I kind of found patent law and discovered that great, like the way it bridges together, like you said, technology, business, and law. Um, you were looking through the microscope and now people are looking at you. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good analogy. <laughs> uh, what I like about patents is they're going to be, right, I, you're on this call because you think patents or IP is important. And no matter what job you have, if you go into R&D, if you go into business, if you go work for a corporation, you're going to need to deal with patents. So I think any knowledge you can gain uh, about patents, even if you don't go into patent law, is is useful. Uh, with uh, a co alternative career for for STEM majors is being an asset manager. So companies will have uh, not only one patent for a crescent wrench; they'll have hundreds of patents and in multiple countries. And you could be an asset manager and. Uh, 
take that portfolio of patents and make sure your company is getting value out of them, whether they're licensing, selling, or or getting patents for the right things in the right area. Uh, a very uh, prevalent job, if you look for the job, uh, technology licensing manager, your university might have an office of technology and commercialization, or you might have the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation where we take university inventions and trying to sell them or license them to business. If you want to be a patent asset manager, look at the job uh, description for technical specialist or intellectual asset manager. Uh, I, uh, well-known job is called patent agent. A patent agent is a person who prepares patent applications for inventors. And another job is called patent lawyer, which prepares patent applications for inventors. Absolutely. I said the same thing twice, but it's true. Uh, IP is important. That's why you're here. Patent lawsuits are going up. Patent application filings across the uh, United States are going up. So there's huge demand for uh, uh, knowledge and, and companies trying to protect their rights. However, fewer and fewer people are going to law school and fewer and fewer of, of people are practicing patents in front of the U.S. Patent Office. So there's, there's kind of a, um, a need. There's, there's a high demand for work and a low supply of people who can do that work. So I think this is a really good career field for someone who has some knowledge in in patents. A patent lawyer, uh, we're a top 20 law school here at the University of Minnesota. If you're not bottom of the barrel and you're a patent lawyer, and I'll contrast a little between patent lawyer and patent agent, patent lawyer could make uh, over $100,000 coming out of law school. I'd say average starting salaries, no experience, are 140, 150. If you want to be in California, DC, New York, maybe 180. Patent agents, uh, you know, national average salary for someone with experience is probably about $115,000. Uh, in this Minneapolis market, we're seeing uh, patent agents with no experience start at about $60,000, $80,000. If you have a PhD, you might make ninety dollars to $100,000 uh, if you're able to get a job with, with experience. Um, what a patent lawyer does. I said before, a patent lawyer works with inventors and R&D and corporations to understand what an invention is, counsels the inventor of, of for what you can get a patent. They then prepare the patent application. They file it with the patent office and conduct business in front of the patent office. A patent lawyer might work as a licensing manager. They might, uh, some patent lawyers specialize in litigation, so they'll hold up a, uh, a patent and litigate in front of the white wig judge and say, 3M has a great patent and that rat from Avery Dennison, you know, infringed it, so you should pay 3M a lot of money. Uh, they also draft legal agreements. A patent lawyer can draft a will, a trust, a, a patent license, a non-disclosure agreement, but they do agreements. A patent agent is not a lawyer. Uh, a patent agent does the same task that a patent lawyer does, except they don't litigate in court in front of the white wig judge, and they don't draft legal agreements. I'd say a patent lawyer, one analogy is uh, to be a physician's assistant. So in the old days, you go to a doctor and the doctor would do your physical, they'd prescribe you medicine, they would put their hands on you and do everything. Now, today, a physician's assistant does most of that work. The physician's assistant has disrupted the medical delivery model. The patent agent has always existed, uh, but is able to do some of the same work as a lawyer. Uh, in order to be a patent agent or a patent lawyer, you need to have a magic degree, a STEM degree, which most of you have. So biology, chemistry, engineering, and you need to file an exam in front of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So Keaton, your track will be, uh, you have a BS biochemistry, you'll take the patent bar, and when you pass that, you're automatically a patent agent. Mm -hmm. And you could go on to law school to be a patent lawyer. So uh, before I, those are, I talked a little bit about patent careers. Uh, anything else you want to add? No, I think you've covered it uh, really well. I think just one thing to, as far as like the patent agent, patent lawyer, Comparison, I what you said with the physician's assistant and that that sort of analogy is so true um, in the firm that like I'm working at, for example, and I think a lot of firms this holds true is the patent agent is typically doing a lot of the prosecution work and, and often the lawyers they do the same thing that the physician would do. They would you know check everything and make sure everything checks out and then they would they would send it away. So um, really good work experience. You know you're getting a lot done when you're um, 
when you're working as a patent agent. Um, yeah, you're doing work as an attorney. The only difference is you're not shown in court and yelling in front of a judge. <laughs> yeah, a patent agent, like Keaton said, I want you to talk a little bit about your experience as a, as a clerk mm -hmm. um, here at the University of Minnesota Law School, but you're doing real work. You're working with real inventors. You're, you're filing and signing papers in front of the patent office, and yay, you're getting your client a patent. A lawyer might check your work, or he might not. So uh, what, are, what are some of the tasks and activities uh, you do, Keaton, in your internship? Yeah, so most of the time what you're doing right now is, or what I'm doing right now is um, office, or office action work. So that is where the inventor, it, you know, they come to you with the invention, they say, hey, I want to patent this invention. You will submit the uh, patent application, and most of the time the examiner at the USPTO will reject you. Uh, for a number of statutory reasons. So what my job is, is to take that office action, so that response from the examiner, and either A, amend the claims, so amend the part of the patent where it's actually claiming what you, are, what you invented, um, and either amend that, so change it a little bit so that where it's allowed, or straight up argue with the examiner. So in short, I'm getting paid to uh, argue <laughs> with a person in, in uh, Virginia, is that where the USPTO Yeah, and is? you're arguing in paper too, right? It's not like yeah, in your uh -huh. face, I'm gonna beat you up, or I need no. to be up in court. <laughs> Right? You, no, none of that. It's all it's all completely online um, over uh, yeah, over official documents. So it's it's really fun. Um, you're always you're looking at technical readings and you're always learning something every day. Um, it's it's a challenging job, but it is it's a rewarding job and it keeps you busy. It's not just uh, it's not just mindless work, you know, looking behind a computer or anything. So that's why I really enjoy it. You get to work with technology, so you get mm -hmm. to use your STEM degree. It, you get to kind of swoop in once the technology is developed, or you get to work closely with invention. Uh, but you don't have to wait for the distillation to work or the failed experiment. Right. You just yeah. get to write up the technical document. Yeah, which you, is a you know, you're at the forefront of, of innovation. You're seeing what's you know what's getting ready to be released or, or what's you know coming out before anybody else does, which is kind of cool. Um, so I, I really enjoy it. And I'd say I'd say the work could be diverse. You one day you may be working on project A and day, the next day uh, technology B. So Without you're not kind of stuck in one area. It's like man, I hate you know rat livers. Right? And I have to keep working on that. You know, one day it's rat livers, the other day it could be uh, you know, insulated cups or transgenic Definitely. genes for corn. Jason, I'm gonna pause there and just double check to see if the audience needs anything for us. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes now talking about the specific program that prepares you for a career in patents. And we'll take some uh, audience questions and we have some pre-planned questions as well. Jason, are there any questions we should address now? Not at the moment. Uh, we did have a question just asking about the, the nomenclature JD versus MS, which I, ex I explained through the chat. Thanks. Uh, yeah, if you want to go into maybe the difference between a JD degree and a, and a master's of patent law, that might be interesting later on if you want to discuss that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. We will. Um, would you, I would say, can you advance the slide, Jason? I would say that um, a... I would say the difference between a JD and a <coughs> MS degree, I would say that the MS degree prepares you for a career as a patent agent, and the JD prepares you for a career as a patent lawyer. Um, Master of Science uh, patent agent typically makes less money than a JD patent lawyer. They generally do the same work, but the patent lawyer, like the doctor, can do a few more things. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about our program here at the University of Minnesota Law School, the M Master of Science in Patent Law. I would say overall our program goals are to have the best program in the country in the area of intellectual property, to have the best students, and for our students to get rewarding jobs. And I'll talk a little bit about those rewarding jobs. Our graduates um, are getting jobs in industry at companies like IBM and Mayo Clinic, and they're also working at big-name law firms like Fish and Richardson and Quarles and Brady. Jason, will you help us advance? Thank you. Uh, our students, uh, I'd say we have, uh, we're a real program. We have a, a, a large uh, body of collegial students who, um, that are fairly uh, diverse. I would say that all our students have STEM undergraduate, master's, or graduate degrees. So we have a number of PhD students and master's students, and uh, probably about, uh, it, a mix of, of bachelor science. The thing about our program, I do think we have one of the best programs in the country because we have a great IP program at the law school and all our JD students take courses like patent law, patent prosecution, uh, portfolio management, IP agreements, 
and our Master of Science of Patent Law students take those same exact courses with the same books, same professors, same classrooms, and you're, Keaton, you're competing against the JD students. Yeah, you're in the same, you're in the same classrooms for the most part as the JD students at the law school, so you, um, I think that's a great, I think that's, if we're going to talk about this now, I think that's one of the best things about the program, um, is that you're with the other JD students in the classrooms. I, I think that it's great. You get to network one with them, which is which is awesome. You're learning the exact same things as the future attorneys are, um, so you're not limited in any sense you know, in the classrooms, versus I know a lot of other programs um, typically have you in a separate classroom, you know, learning separate things. I like that you're just uh, essentially thrown into the actual uh, law school classrooms, like patent law, and, uh, et cetera, which is awesome. Is the environment um, collegial, competitive, cutthroat? No, not, not in any I wouldn't consider it cutthroat necessarily. I think everybody is um, everybody's friendly, one, at the law school. I haven't, I haven't met anybody bad. I think in terms of uh, the competitive nature as far as the academia goes, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, every master's um, class, you are on a separate curve ultimately. Um, so the master's students aren't graded on the exact same curve as um, JD students. So JD students in typical classrooms over, I think, 30 students, there's uh, there's a curve. So you know a certain amount of people will get A's, a certain amount of people will get lower than that, et cetera. It's your, your common bell curve. Uh, master's students are graded separately, so you won't have to compete with the students in, you won't have to compete with the second year, third year law students who are very familiar with final exams when, you know, in reality, you haven't had that so, so if during grading those students are identified as, as being master student, do you feel you could hold your own with some of the JD students and in classes? Oh, without a doubt. Um, and the professor uh, expects you to. Furthermore, I mean, you are, you're getting called on in class as, as that happens in law school. You get called on and they expect you to keep up with everything, and, and you do. Um, so in that, nature, in that nature, I think the, the professors don't distinguish you as a master student. Um, everybody is on equal terms in the classroom, which I think is great. Um, so absolutely. I think another benefit of the program at this school is is you create a portfolio of work. You create deliverables uh, that you could use and show your potential employers. Every job description says, you know, you need two years experience. Uh, but if you say, hey, I've written two patent applications and I filed a reply to them with a with the patent office and I've done a patent opinion and landscape, I think those are examples. I, I think that is a benefit uh, of of the program. Another benefit is is here in Minnesota we've got. Uh, we're in Medical Device Alley, so we've got uh, professors teaching our classes from a variety of big name law firms and corporations. The program is available uh, full time or part time. We try and stack uh, the classes. So this is a typical uh, typical uh, <laughs> week at the law school where a student would be required to take the yellow classes and generally have Thursdays and Fridays off. And I know in your Thursdays and Fridays you go work at your internship. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I will pause there for any uh, questions we might have, Jason or Keaton. Any things you'd, you'd like to add before we conclude? We might be covering this mm. next, but uh, there's nothing next. So oh, all okay, questions. Okay. Job outlook for job outlook for recent graduates. You would know that one. So job outlook for recent graduates. We have 90% uh, have a job uh, within 12 months of graduation. I'd say that also. Um, our students have a pass rate of the, of the patent bar of about 86%, where the national average is 50% uh, or below. So, uh, you know, on our website, it shows our graduates working at Fish and Richardson, and Quarles and Brady, Nike, Mayo Clinic, IBM, uh, and as well as uh, with small firms. Some students say that the master's itself helps distinguish themselves when they get a job. Uh, it helps me distinguish me from the pool. Some of our master's students have gone on to be examiners at the patent office. Some of our students have, have gone on to law school. A uh, question about uh, the type of the uh, style of class. Are they all lecture style or are any of them field classes? Yeah, so they're, um, as far as field credit, you, you can get credit for uh, having an internship. Um, so for example, I, I currently have a, co a clerkship at a law firm. I could receive class credit for that. You can opt whether you want to receive it or not. Alternatively, you can just take separate courses. Um, in regards to the, the lectures, so most of the the more, uh, I shouldn't say more serious law courses, but the more bigger scale, so more uh, more student population law classes like your patents course, are those, those are more lecture-based um, courses. They're using the Socratic method. If you're not familiar with that, that is essentially where you are scheduled to, you're assigned readings prior to class, usually it involves cases. 
Uh, you read the cases before class, um, and then during the actual class, it's more of a discussion base, so the professor will call on you and they'll say, uh, you know, Mr. Kruger, give me the uh, analysis of the case, or uh, what are the facts of the case, or what have you. Um, and so it's more along that, and then, you know, you answer the question, they bounce back with another question, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how that setting works. There's also um, more lecture-heavy courses. So, for example, uh, patent prosecution is more of a, a lecture course. They'll still call on you and expect you to participate, um, but it's more of a, a lecture where they're teaching you. That course is really cool because they're teaching you everything you learn in the statutory courses. They're teaching you how to actually apply that um, in a real-world setting. Um, and then you also have seminar classes where you have um, – people from different uh, career professions and they um, come and they give uh, presentations about either what their career is or you know some some new and hot thing in, in, in law or in IP so um, you get a little bit of everything I think with the program I don't know if, if there's anything else you want yeah, to say with that. I would just add on that it is a, a stereo part of it is a stereotypical law school experience where mm -hmm. the master students are integrated with the law school. I mean, Absolutely. You're, uh, we've had some questions about uh, seeing the slides again and seeing your, your pictures again, and I think it's safe to say we'll be sharing the, the slide deck with participants so they can review that. Actually, yeah, if, they, yeah, if, they've, got, if they've got a specific request, why don't they send, send an email to patlaw at yeah. UMN, and Jason could, could share the slide desk. We're also recording this, so we'll make it available as well. Uh, we had a few questions about... Uh, Do they want to share my picture? They want to see your picture. <laughs> <laughs> not, sure, not sure we should, we should be concerned about that. Uh, well, <laughs> that yeah, that's, that's, that's Jason planted that. Want to see your names. They want to see your names as well. Um, we have a few questions about um, patent law across different countries and jobs overseas. Um, I'll, I'll address. I'll, I'll address the general topic. We we generally teach U.S. patent law here at the law school to prepare you for a job as a patent lawyer or a patent agent to practice in front of the U.S. Patent Office. I would say we also have international and comparative patent law classes. Uh, the the law in the United States is similar to other countries, but we don't prepare you. We we don't go into. Uh, here's how you pass the patent bar in China. We have a question about um, the, uh, the ethical responsibility involved with patents. Um, someone who's interested in technology and law, um, they have a distaste for the business aspects that you described, and they worry about um, uh, business-related studies and, and how that, uh, um, let's say, the prioritization of financial gain over the assistance and amplification of patent and technologies in a way that maximizes the good that they can do for community. Uh, so, so I'll address. I'll address. Balance that responsibility. Yeah, you know, I think at the at the law school we have a, a big tent, and we take many perspectives. And part of law school is looking at problems and issues through different lenses. Uh, so some jobs you could get um, with a background in patent is policy. Uh, you could be a, a attaché from the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, or, sorry, from the go U.S. government and an attaché in India or China. Uh, we do some things called patent landscapes where you look at technology in area and you could use that information to help you make policy decisions or strategic decisions. Uh, you don't necessarily need to work at a law firm or a law company. You might work for a nonprofit like a university in a, in a technology transfer area. So I think that would be uh, generally addresses those type of questions. So, so Jason, uh, we've got just uh, one minute left. I think we'll conclude and, and I'd like to thank everyone uh, for their time and attention, for signing up for the seminar. If you have any questions, please email us at patlaw at umn.edu um, and feel free to get in touch with <clears throat> uh, either of us, uh, Chris Tarosky, Keaton Kruger, or you'll see Jason Stebner. So thank Keaton, anything else before we conclude? No, I think that's it. I think we covered everything. Um... Thanks for your time and attention. Have a good day and good luck on finals. <laughs>